Hi, everybody. Charles Hoskinson here, live from warm, sunny Colorado. I have a requested video. I have a big backlog of whiteboard videos. and Sometimes they come from within, sometimes they come from outside. I have noticed that there's a great degree of confusion about Atala and Cardano and enterprise versus non-enterprise, permission versus non-permission. And it's gotten to the point where the prime minister, well, the former prime minister of Georgia, writes an article about how he's super excited to be working with us and using Cardano. And I see on the Reddit uh, that uh, people are saying, oh, that's just a, a, a Tala or something. And it's not. Actually, they're using Cardano. Uh, but uh, that uh, that doesn't count. So I wanted to make a video and kind of talk about what is the difference between these two things and explain the strategy and how they are complementary to each other. Okay. So years ago, uh, we were building Cardano, and at the same time, we had all of these enterprise clients who came in, and they said, hey, uh, we can't really at this moment go on to permissionless infrastructure for a variety of regulatory reasons, legal reasons, uh, business logic reasons, blah, blah, blah. We want to have control over the infrastructure, but we still want to work in federation with partners and be on a blockchain-like system. And the usual solution for these types of things is Fabric or something like it. Fabric is basically a permission ledger infrastructure and you have control over the consensus by basically saying it's permissioned. And they have this thing called chain code and chain code is uh, like their, their notion of smart contract. It's the logic behind how transactions get segregated and so forth. So a lot of companies are using Fabric today, and they tend to use Fabric with partners. Like Walmart, for example, uses Fabric, and they say, okay, for our food supply chains, you must dial in, you must connect into this infrastructure for that. But ultimately, Walmart wants to be in control. Now, a permissionless infrastructure, these are things like Ethereum or Cardano. And there, the consensus is under the control of, and the infrastructure is under the control of the community. Okay, so you have permissionless consensus. Anyone can jump in and if they own enough of the resource that enables consensus, they can participate. And that resource can be hash power, that resource can be the token, but there's some notion of a resource. And whoever owns that resource is able to participate in running the system. And then obviously they have a different notion for logic. We have this concept of smart contracts. And there's different ways of doing that. Okay. Now, both cases, chain code and smart contracts, they usually talk to third-party infrastructure. Okay, and that's why Ethereum has Infura and Web3 and uh, all these other concepts. And we have on-chain, off-chain code with the Plutus concept and so forth. So this model right here is a little agnostic to whether the consensus happens to be permissioned or permissionless, permissionless, permissioned or permissionless, excuse me. Uh, it just does its thing. So back in the day, we created Atala as a way of onboarding enterprise government and other clients and getting them into some sort of enterprise infrastructure so we can have clients and we can have users, okay? And these deals we talk around, like for example, the Georgia deal, that gives us 50,000 new users per year minimum. And it has potential to scale to hundreds of thousands potentially getting into the tourism is industry where there's 10 million tourists per year. Now, it's a lot easier to talk about permission to infrastructure in a government conversation and in a corporate setting. But the point is that these two are not actually that far apart and they're interoperable with each other. Okay, the users should be able to flow between these two systems. And in fact, a lot of cases when we say who's going to run the infrastructure, they say, oh, we really don't want to do that. And once you're further along in the business relationship, you can say, well, no, no, let's go ahead and run that on permissionless infrastructure. They say, okay, fine. So more often than not, actually, the conversation can move in a permissionless direction. But because the users in the system, they have identity, and our preferred identity is to use a DID through our PRISM platform, and they have access to public private keys, so they have addresses and wallets and these things, it's very easy to migrate those users from one system to another system. Now, Duncan Coots is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And what Duncan did, which was really brilliant, 
is if you look at Cardano, Cardano under the hood can run in a permissioned and it can run in a permissionless mode. So we already demonstrated this. Why? Because the OBFT nodes were selected by others. That's a closed consensus set. And that's what's Byron. And now we're moving into Shelly. And as Shelly keeps waking up, more and more are made by Preos, which is a permissionless system. But there's still a permission component for now. So that means that Cardano actually can be deployed almost like it's fabric. It just has to be packaged correctly. So one of the things that we did is we joined the Hyperledger Foundation and we're in discussions about just this topic, how to run Cardano as a turnkey permission system. And all that knowledge we gained from servicing the Itala workflow in the old days when Bruno was in charge and Alan McSherry was doing work and Danelle was there, all of that knowledge that we gained can be ported into that permission philosophy of Cardano. And what's really beautiful is that as Cardano evolves as a product, all of those evolutions go to the permissioned version of it as well. The performance improvements, the smart contract capabilities, the multi-asset capabilities, and so forth. Now, the existing Atala group, really what they're focused on right now is layer two. So the first layer two is Prism, but then also Hydra will fall under that as well. And there's a litany of other things that can be considered. Now, these pieces of infrastructure are blockchain agnostic. So that means that they can sit in the permission side or they can sit in the permissionless side. It doesn't matter. And the beautiful thing is because this DNA is the same, that means that transactions and users inevitably will be able to flow between these two systems. Identity can flow between these two systems. Value can flow between these two systems. So in essence, what we can look at is saying that this is a user acquisition machine. When we go do a government deal, they're trying to solve a problem. And we're over solving the problem for the benefit of Cardano. How so? Because when we bring them into a supply chain system, an identity system, any of these things, inevitably all those people get economic identity. That is portable. Okay? That's the key word here, economic identity that is portable. Fluid. It can flow between a permission system and a permissionless system. And they can move value around. And Cardano becomes the connecting tissue between all of these different systems. And that's beautiful because then you can have highly customized logic for the customer custom access control and permission uh, policies, privacy policies, just like what IBM is trying to accommodate with Fabric. But then suddenly anybody who's using that system has a degree of interoperability and they can move value into the main system. So this is something that we're gonna unify in 2021. We say we're writing a big proposal next year for continuing IO Global's participation in the Cardano ecosystem. Some of this has to do with rolling up all the innovations we've come up with that were out of scope for the 2020 agreement. Some of these have to do for emerging next generation technologies like ZK rollups and recursive snarks and all kinds of scalability uh, solutions that will really push the system to the next level. And then some of these have to do with unifying permissioned and permissionless together. The Atala portfolio is going to keep building all these beautiful blockchain agnostic layer two systems. And Cardano benefits from that, but any enterprise user of our system benefits from that. And the permission setting, if we get approval in the 2021, we're going to call this Gerolamo. Why Gerolamo? Because that was the first name of Cardano, Gerolamo Cardano. And so Gerolamo and Cardano together makes permission and permissionless. It's unified together, and that'll become a hyperledger project. Uh, and it's something that can compete with Fabric and Sawtooth and these other things. And we think there's a lot of magic there because we're already building out all this beautiful infrastructure that's being battle-hardened in a $3 billion ecosystem 
And that battle hardening is uh, something that will give a lot of consumer confidence. Furthermore, we're starting to rack up a lot of wins and we can write a lot of commercial white papers describing why this system is better. And anytime Cardano gets faster, the permission side gets faster and the maintenance of that permission side is significantly less involved. There are certain things to optimize it, but that we can have a much, much smaller team on it and they get uh, downstream contributions from they get upstream contributions flowing downstream from the permissionless side. Okay, so that's the difference between permissioned and permissionless and Atala and Cardano. Atala has become a layer two ID, uh, and I, I, a layer two portfolio, I should say. And it's all about adding new capabilities, Oracle capabilities, payment systems, identity systems, these types of things. And we're gonna keep building out that portfolio. And these are blockchain agnostic. And what used to be a Tala in the early days, which we were using to basically build relationships with third party organizations and governments has become that layer two portfolio. And we would like to pull Cardano completely into the permission permissionless world and have two deployment scenarios for it. Duncan architected Cardano in a way that it's very easy to move between these two ideologies. And we did that with Byron and Shelley, for example. And now we're, uh, we're in a position where we can abstract this a little bit more, keep adding more value to it. And sometime in 2021, we'll have a beautiful fluid strategy between both of them, where anybody who's on either side of the system will have economic identity and can easily get into the permissionless system if desired. And we'll, of course, always push that in the contracts that we roll out. So the adoption of a permission ledger benefits Cardano in terms of transaction volume and user base. Okay, so I hope that brings some clarity to all of this. These things are, of course, complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces. And there's a lot to think about. But all things considered, the infrastructures come together quite nicely. We have a beautiful network design, which is much better than our competitors. We have a really simple, easy to use BFT protocol that's extremely performant and much better than most of our competitors. We have a lot of cool things coming, like already peer to peer is being pushed out and it's layered on top of that beautiful network design and in the extended UTXO model and multi-asset and Plutus are imminent. They're coming out and they're being layered onto that model as well. And all of these things go downstream and benefit the permission side as much as they do the permissionless side. And our hope is if we get our contract renewal next year from you guys, the community, when Voltaire is ready for that, uh, we will have a very comprehensive enterprise strategy that we're gonna propose alongside that. And that enterprise strategy will benefit and grow Cardano as a whole. So everybody wins in that respect. We learned a lot from Hyperledger. We learned a lot from Fabric. We learned a lot from the time we spent with this contracting. And just like our work on Ethereum Classic, people often ask, well, how does that benefit Cardano? Well, interchain interoperability is always good because users and transactions make sense. But more importantly, competitive analysis at its highest level is to build your competitor's product. Um, it's almost like capturing an enemy aircraft and disassembling it piece by piece. You slowly but surely learn how your enemy's stealth technology works and their engines work and their missiles work and so forth. And that's exactly what we did by building the EVM in-house and by building a full Ethereum client, we developed a mastery of that technology that firms only like consensus have and parity tech have. Therefore, that knowledge can then be applied towards how can we be better what must we compete with? What are the things we shouldn't do? Where are the flaws and so forth in this design? And that was one of the biggest benefits of working on Ethereum Classic. Similarly, all the permission work we did gave us a lot of ideas about how enterprise customers intend on using this product. And what's beautiful about an enterprise adopter is that when they talk about Cardano, they have both options. And they know if they don't wanna run the infrastructure, the movement of applications uh, from one system to the other system is going to be rather trivial for them. So low cost migration cost. And the other thing is that our layer two portfolio continues to evolve and the underlying ledger continues to evolve. So they know that the technology that they've built on for free will get better for them. They don't have to pay anything for that, just gonna happen. This big treasury system and all this development work that's going on, they get all of those uh, upstream contributions and it's just a big benefit to them. That's a beautiful thing to be in when you're a company is to know that you get free upgrades 
and to know that you don't have to host the infrastructure if you don't want to. If you want to, there's an option for that. And your user base has uh, a whole dimension of new capabilities that they're going to be able to uh, embrace. So I think we have a very competitive strategy as we enter into 2021, and we're going to be really excited to share that with you guys. In the meantime, I hope this brings some clarity behind these different concepts of Vitala versus permission ledgers versus permissionless ledgers and how it all fits together. And uh, we're making great progress in every respect. And we have some phenomenal product people in every respect. And the Atala portfolio continues to grow. Uh, Hydra's team is being reconstituted. Uh, Prism is, is moving along very well. And we've already made some major milestones there. Before the end of the year, we should have a lot of cool stuff. We're already finding great partners that want to get in that ecosystem because of how powerful it is. Uh, and these are just two of many layer two solutions that are going to be in the Atala portfolio as a company. And all of those will be interoperable with Cardano. And hopefully, if you guys want it, we'll be interoperable with a permission strategy as a hyperledger project for Cardano. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope to bring some clarity. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Cheers.